no problem. Boyle and Wilson were the architects that Frank Morgan and his team hired. Boyle and Wilson had been around. They had their offices in downtown Oakland Park. They were well known. They did churches and apartment complexes and schools and smaller shopping centers. This is a photo of the two of them in front of uh, what was then their latest accomplishment. That's the Valley View Bank there at 95th and Foster. So they were hired to design the plans, which they immediately started. And I like showing this in case you didn't already know it. The overall property of Metcalf South was uh, interesting in that where the Sears is. I don't know if you can make it out, but there's a red dash outline around a big chunk of the overall property. All of that was owned by Sears. So Sears owned land, and Sears owned their building, and they hired a separate architect to design it. So all that, all that uh, Boyle and Wilson had to do was work with the Sears architects to make sure all the pieces would come together. But it was under separate ownership completely, and, and that's kind of why the building is still there. They whipped up these drawings in about six months, which, uh, given the size of it and the magnitude of it, is amazing. You couldn't do it today in six months. But it was a different time. Uh, some of the initial floor plans that they had worked up conceptually. Uh, there's all kinds of interesting things that history geeks like me find interesting in this. Uh, Y'all remember the Pooches cafeteria? Okay, that was originally supposed to just be shops up here in the corner. The whole Pooch's cafeteria was a, a bit of an afterthought. Uh, the escalators, the wonderful crisscross escalators over the main open courtyard. Um, all of these are drawings that are in our possession. We got them. Uh, a little backstory: Lane 4 owned the property in 2017 and it was scheduled to be torn down. So I reached out to Owen Buckley, who was the president of Lane 4, who I knew from years ago when I worked at Mission Hills. And he was willing to let me round up a small army, and he gave us a two-day window of opportunity to go in the mall and salvage or take whatever we thought we could use. So there was a handful of us that did go in over two days, and we broke off tiles, we broke out uh, bricks, we took signage, we took some lights. But I made a beeline for the, a back corner office on the lower level because I knew that was where the architects had their office. And I thought, now, odds are it's empty, but you never know. Imagine my surprise to find they hadn't taken anything out of that office. So all the plans, the original construction drawings, hand drawn, all the subsequent remodels and additions and tenant finishes, all the contracts, all the change orders, all the general correspondence, you name it, it was all still there. So we grabbed them all up and threw them in our cars and took them all home. <coughs> Along the back wall here is uh, two tables that have some of those drawings that you might want to go over and take a look at if you haven't already. And you can see how architects used to hand draw everything which I'm sure Mr. George Lund can relate to back then. <laughs> yes. Also, boxes full of just sketches, including these. So this was the original conceptual sketches for the what we call the pan, pan fountain, where everybody tossed their coins. Uh, originally, Frank Morgan envisioned just a huge spray of water <laughs> that would shoot up two stories high. And there's correspondence, letters from the manufacturers of the fountain saying, Mr. Morgan, no, you don't want to shoot water up that high because it's going to, there's going to be spill and overflow and people are going to get wet. So Frank had to be educated, he had to be schooled. And we ended up with uh, the pan fountain, which was great because I can't tell you how many thousands of dollars worth of coins were tossed into that fountain over the 50 years and almost all of it went to charity. So construction gets underway, and some of you may know this, some of you may not. Uh, they had to clear the site, they had to tear down a couple of uh, buildings that were there, but there was a house on the property, it was a ranch house, uh, 
kind of a low uh, prairie style ranch with a big roof overhang. And that house was to be moved, not demolished, but moved. And in fact, it was moved. And this is a current picture of it. It is just uh, up the street to the east on 95th Street between Rowe and El Monte. But what I, and I used to, I could see this house from my bedroom window growing up, so I, I knew that was the old Metcalf South house. What I didn't realize till I did my research is the gentleman who moved it delivered it to the site and left it on skids and walked away. And the city had to issue a citation and then eventually an injunction and a subsequent order to the, the house mover's name was Richard Landy, get it on the foundation and landscape it or we're putting you in jail. <laughs> Uh, so that prompted him to, in fact, put it on the foundation and landscape. <laughs> but it's just kind of cool. If you're ever driving down 95th Street, you'll notice it. It kind of sticks out. But that house used to be on the Metcalf South property. Here's just a couple of photos of the mall under construction. Uh, the contractor was Martin Salisbury out of Topeka. Uh, Frank Morgan had worked with them on other shopping center projects and, of course, uh, the architects knew them very well, so it was a good relationship. They were a logical choice to build the mall. Uh, that's just a picture of a lot of the figureheads meeting out at the corner of 95th and Metcalf after they had put up a sign advertising, hey, guess what's coming? Generate excitement, but it, it violated every sign code. <laughs> so you probably can't tell, but there's the then mayor, Duarte Enoch trying to negotiate a deal. And a deal was struck. I think they just kind of weighed the rules because the sign was just going to be temporary. As far as construction goes, it was relatively smooth sailing. There was only a few eventful things that happened while it was under construction. In January, on the 24th of 1967, there was a pretty good windstorm that managed to blow down a wall that was 14 feet high and 125 feet long and also blew off portions of the roof. So that was a bit of a setback right in the heart of winter. In May of 1967, a 45-year-old worker uh, kind of got semi-crushed in a ditch collapse. You know, OSHA, OSHA was right there and said, well, you didn't have the, the bracing required, da, 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 da. So that led to a little dust up, but the man was treated and released. Another gentleman in July, shortly before the mall opened, he fell 20 feet off of the ladder and hit his head on a concrete floor and suffered head lacerations, but he was treated and released. And also in July, somebody stole about $800, $875 worth of materials from the Harsfelds and Woolworth stores. So, you know, for a project of that size to only have those four little blips, that's not bad, really. I like this letter. Uh, I'm, is Bob Gingrich here? Okay, who's Bob Gingrich? It was iffy whether he'd be able to make it. Bob worked for Frank. He was hired to be their marketing and promotions man for the first four years that the mall was open. And uh, this letter signed by Bob was among the treasure trove of documents we found and which is over on that table. Basically, he sent this letter to the architects saying, this is the official logo, the Metcalf with the down arrow representing South. And this is the uh, official font style that we will have. And he's telling the architect, we really probably need to find a way to incorporate this, this sign on the building somewhere. <laughs> well, I interviewed Mr. Gingrich a few months ago, and he told me the backstory on that. He said, well, Brad, the reason I created that letter and sent it to the architect is because Frank Morgan didn't think the building needed any signage. He thought it, it would be its own sign. It would stand on its own. And Bob scratched his head and he said, well, I guarantee you Sears and Jones are going to want signs. And I really think you probably need to identify the center. And he thought it was just, <laughs> at the end of the day, he just thought, well, Frank's just being thrifty. I'm just trying to save a buck. So he, he, he worked through the architect. And the architects did uh, strongly encourage Morgan and his group to put signage on the building, but they still said no. In fact, it wasn't until years after it was opened 
that there was anything that said Metcalf South on the building itself. Uh, these are just examples of what we call punch lists. As you get near the end of a construction project, people go through with a fine-tooth comb and make a list of every little thing that needs to be corrected, modified, fixed, touched up. And it's fascinating reading through pages of punch lists, all the little things that needed to be done in all the various little tenant areas. But again, given a building of its size, it was a well-constructed facility I'm not going to say no corners were cut, but very few were cut. So the punch list really wasn't that long compared to what I've seen today. So now we're getting to the summer of 67 and it's getting exciting. Everybody sees the thing has risen out of the ground and then it starts getting marketed and advertised on television and of course in the newspaper. So the artist renderings start coming out, getting people excited about the, the caliber of tents that will be in the mall. Ellsberg Diamonds, Jack Henry, which only have a location on the plaza. My gosh, it's coming out to Oakland Park. Quite cool. Rothschilds, Adlers, quality clothiers. Bob Gingrich told me this during our interview. He said the night before we were to have our grand opening, he wanted to have a VIP party. Well, Frank didn't want it to happen because he knew they were going to be busy working all night long getting things ready. Well, Bob said it's important to have this VIP party. So Frank let him, but he said, okay, well, you can have it, but you have to do it down near the Jones store and don't be wandering all through the mall. So that was the deal that was struck. Uh, but Bob remembers the evening quite well. He said all the politicians were there, local radio and TV personalities were there. Uh, he said, I even remember seeing Izzy Ozer, who was one of Frank's investors, a suit and tie man, running the concrete floor polisher on the bottom floor, just trying to get things ready. 